So thanks everybody for coming to the last talk of the day. Our talk is improving the security of a major open source project one step at a time. If you haven't noticed already, it's we're going to be talking about our experience in the Node.js project. And I'm hoping that maybe, you know, when we share some of our experience, maybe we'll hear some, you know, we can hear back from some people's experience in their other their own projects as well. So a little bit about ourselves be before we get started. I'm Michael Dawson. I'm the Node.js lead for Red Hat and IBM. What that means is I get to spend a lot of time in the Node community. I'm a contributor on the Technical Steering Committee. Mem uh, technical steering committee. I also get to spend time uh, working with the OpenJS Foundation that Node.js is pro part of, as well as working with uh, a lot of our good teams within IBM and Red Hat who have large Node deployments. We work with our customers using Node um, and so forth. And so now I'll hand it over to Paula. And I am clearly not Rafael Gonzaga. Uh, but Rafael is the person who contributed to this uh, topic that we're going to talk about today, one of many people on the team. He's currently in Brazil where he was made. He's a Node.js Technical Steering Committee member, uh, also a security working group lead, Node.js releaser, and as of this week, he received the JavaScript Londia uh, Security Pathway uh, Finder Award, so very proud of all the work that he's done here. But I am <laughs> Paula Paul. And standing in for Rafael as best I can. He's in Brazil, and I can be here. Um, I'm a uh, sponsor of the uh, DX or Developer Experience team at Nearform, or OSPO as well. And I am uh, very happy to serve the OpenJS Foundation board and the Grace Hopper Celebration Open Source Day. A little bit more about that later. Uh, open source and Node admirer. So I think I'll hand this back. So thanks. Um, so I'm just going to give you a little bit of an overview about what we're going to go through. Um, I'll start with the background, a little bit of background, a little bit about the Node project, a little bit about some OSS, OSSF funding that we got, because we're very grateful for that, and that's helped us to do a lot of the work that we're going to be talking about today. Um, and then we'll share our experience. And, you know, we're going to start by sharing experience on the reactive side, so the life of a vulnerability, how do we manage them, and, you know, what's worked for us, what hasn't worked. And then Paul is going to jump into what we're doing to be more proactive. So we have a security working group, um, and that's really been re reinvigorated over the last year. And we're going to talk about some of the things that we're doing on that front and how that, that how we think that's helping. And then finally, we'll just finish off with like how you can help. Often people are like, how do I get involved in the Node project and help out? And I think a lot of our suggestions hopefully also apply to other projects as well in terms of that. So. First of all, the Node project, I call it an open open source project. I didn't coin that, but uh, it was coined by one of the early earlier collaborators, uh, Rod Vag. And really, we use that because there's no one company that really directs the Node project. There's lots of people and lots of individual contributors, several companies, but it's not like there's one group that says, here's our roadmap, here's what we're doing. That comes with lots of benefits and some challenges, especially in terms of like security, we don't have one company who's going to say, hey, we're going to fund all of the security work and make sure that things are, are, are secure. It's a large project. We've had over 3,000 contributors over the years. We have 96 collaborators. Those are people who can review and land pull requests. Um, and it's widely used. We had over a billion downloads just from our download site. That doesn't, uh, last year, that doesn't include things like Docker pulls, which were probably another billion, and then however people just, you know, pull from caches and stuff like this. So very widely used. It's at the top of the open SSF criticality score, and that's why we end up getting funding. Um, I should say security has always been very top of mind for the project, so I think you'll see through some of the things we've always been doing that right from the very beginning, people thought we have to make sure that things are secure. We have like a separate CI just for releases so that we can separate who has access to the test infrastructure and the release infrastructure and so forth. Um, but I think one thing I've learned and seen is that volunteers are a pretty poor match for time critical work. It's easy to volunteer for something when you can do that on your own time, um, develop a feature and push that forward. But for security release, sometimes we even get vulnerabilities with deadlines. And we had a case where like the deadline was gonna expire over Christmas. Not a great time to be asking volunteers to come in and do work to get the security release out the window. Um, so that's something that's like been a challenge that, that I'll talk a little bit as we go through. So last uh, 2022, we got some OSSF funding. Um, it's continuing into, into 2023. And I think you'll see as we talk about some of the successes of that, it's not just the work that that person who's been funded could do. 
Um, it is very good to have somebody who can basically make it their top priority to fix security problems, do releases, but they've also been able to, to provide the critical mass that lets you do more proactive work and bring in other people who then can, can contribute, but without that sort of critical mass, it wouldn't happen because you need somebody who's focusing on it and pushing it forward and bringing all those people together. So that's a little bit of background. We'll now look at the life of a security vulnerability and we'll talk through the different steps, the threat model, the security reports, creating sites for secure releases. And then we just have a small example just to, to, to illustrate the complexity of some of the issues we have to deal with and how that fits into that cycle. So first the threat model. And I put the threat model in the life of a security vulnerability because really we hope to get to the point where people use the threat model to decide whether or not something is a vulnerability up front. I have this picture is because without a threat model, it often feels like this is what we're doing when people report vulnerabilities to us. Um, we don't always agree on what a vulnerability is and people are quite disappointed sometimes when we're like, ah, we don't think that's a vulnerability. And we can have some really long conversations which aren't necessarily very productive. And with a threat model, hopefully we avoid a lot of those discussions because we've been mu much clearer up front what we will consider a vulnerability and what we won't. And of course, it's not perfect. It's a, it's a living document, and so we don't just do things black and white. But we have found that that helps quite a bit in the initial discussion. So this is just an example. You know, Who here would look at this and say, that's a security vulnerability because we can you know, basically cause a denial of service of, of your runtime? So OK, so maybe. so. We, we quite often get reports that are not quite this straightforward, but actually are along those lines, and we don't consider them a, a security vulnerability because if you ask us to run a piece of code, and so you're basically saying, load this thing, which is huge, we're just doing what we, you told us to do, right? And so in our security model, we wouldn't necessarily consider that a vulnerability. Um, and in the more subtle ones, it, it, it does get to be an additional uh, it's like it's, it's far less clear, but it's still the, the same sort of position that we have. And that's where we hope our threat model will help to explain why we wouldn't consider this a vulnerability, why we would consider other things to be a vulnerability. So in the, in the, the, the threat model, we actually base it on what do we trust, what do we don't trust, and then we have a number of examples. And so if, and we try and cast it in, if we don't trust, X, and through X you can cause something bad to happen, like a denial of service, uh, disclosure of information that shouldn't be. Yeah, that's a vulnerability. If it's something we trust in our model, like for example, we assume that you have a, a system which is properly configured, you have your security privileges set on your file system, and so if, if it's something where you change a file on your file system that's under your control, we trust that, and we're not gonna consider that a security vulnerability. Um, we've published it in our security.md. It's a fairly recent addition. I will say it's really hard to define these. I, you know, we went out there. We, we had some, uh, some people from like, uh, security companies, like their businesses working in security. There wasn't like an easy pattern to say, here's a security model or a threat model, and here's what's in it. Um, so we basically built up what we think will work with us, but it is a work in progress. We've tweaked it a number of times times over the last year as we get vulnerabilities, we look at it and say, well, what answer does it, does it suggest? Hmm, maybe we don't agree, let's tweak it. Or yes, it, it makes sense, let's move forward with that. This is just a more specific example. So this is a case that says, in our threat model, if we load a file and we haven't documented that that file is gonna be loaded, we would consider that a security vulnerability because then you know, if we're trusting, if, if we're putting it on, or sort of expecting you to control your environment, but we haven't told you that we're gonna load this file, how are you gonna protect that file, give it the right rights, that kind of stuff. So th in that case, we would say, yep, that's a vulnerability. We may fix it through documentation by making sure we properly document that. So that's one of the states statements in the threat model. On the flip side, you know, we have examples, and we have examples of what is and isn't a vulnerability, but in this case, this is the flip side where it says, you know, if somebody reports a CWE 15 um, and they're saying, well, like, hey, I'm setting something in this file and we've properly documented that that file is loaded when we start up, then we don't consider that a vulnerability. 
And that's the level of information we've tried to put into the, the, the threat model. Um, I'm not going to go through everything in the threat model, but you can go read it. It's in our security.md. Um, the next part are security reports. So this is the way that we handle security reports. Of course, please don't open public issues. Um, we document the process in our security.md. We use HackerOne. So in the best case, somebody comes up, figures out they have a vulnerability. The first step is they look at our threat model. Yay, they figured out, yes, it is a, it is a vulnerability based on that threat model. They go to HackerOne. You can find Node.js is one of the projects where you can report vulnerabilities. There's a nice support, submit report button. You can fill in the details. And our team gets a vulnerability in its inbox. So that's how things come in. In terms of once we've got it, we've got a triage team. And I'll talk a little bit more about this where like what worked, what didn't work. But we have a triage team. We'll look at the things in the inbox. We'll discuss them based on the threat model. And we'll end up with, yeah, we believe that is a, a vulnerability or not. Often that there's, there's back and forth. Uh, it gives us a nice tool where we can privately have that discussion with the reporter. We can also easily bring in additional experts if we need somebody who has uh, expertise in a particular area um, to a particular and very specific report as opposed to giving them access to like all the reports that are there. Once we've decided it's accepted, we need to give it a CVE rating and assign, we use the CVSS score calculator. Our experience on this is unfortunately it does kind of drive things to high. So, you know, if you just blindly fill it out, you're going to end up with something that can easily be a fire alarm for the whole community. So uh, my feedback is like when you're <coughs> filling these in and doing that for your project, really think about each of the components because the, the, depending on how the, the score comes out, you may cause a lot of work for your community. There's companies that say like if it's above a certain rating, it has to be fixed within a week. And, you know, basically so it can drive a lot of work and a lot of questions and all that kind of stuff. So spending a little bit more time in getting that calculation right is really worth it. So back to the, we want to share our experience and then maybe you know, people will share their experience, we can, we can go from there. So what didn't work for us? We started out like taking reports through email. That's kind of an easy way, but it's very hard to collaborate. You know, you, you get a long, uh, a long, sort of long stream of messages. It's hard to bring people in. Um, we also tried like ad hoc triaging. So we were using HackerOne, but there wasn't really anybody responsible for triaging initial reports. Um, what we saw happen most of the time is like people would get involved and then they'd sort of feel like they had to do them all because nobody else did them and it kind of fed on itself. So you would end up burning out somebody because, you know, with one or a small number of triagers, they would, you know, a small number of people would end up doing it and it over time just didn't work. Like even on my team at Red Hat, I tried to get, make space for it to be like it's part of your daily work and we know that you're going to be doing this, but it, it, it still wasn't fun enough, I think, in the end to do that to be sustainable long term. What is working for us though is we have like a, now have a triage team of more than three people. I think we have about eight or nine people on that team. We have a very well-defined triage rotation. So you're on triage rotation for two weeks. Um, and that doesn't mean you're gonna do all of the triage, but you're gonna say like, hey, thanks for the report. And you know, try and help move it forward, bring in experts if it's not, not your area, that kind of stuff. And other people still jump in. And I think people are even more likely to jump in because they know they're not going to be stuck being the only one who triages that one and have to take it all the way to the end. So you've got your two weeks, you can dedicate your time, and, and that works really, really nicely. HackerOne's also working quite nicely, I think, because it gives us that private place to report. It's a nice place to collaborate. But it also is, lets us make things public afterwards. Like the project is very, very, feels very important about making everything as transparent as possible. So we stream all our meetings, we try and do everything in GitHub. Security is a challenge on that front and that you know before we've actually fixed the vulnerability, we don't necessarily want to disclose it. But this is a nice balance be between being able to handle it in private, but then actually disclose it afterwards, sure. There, there's actually uh, in the tool you can have a, uh, you can make messages to the team or to everybody, and I think it just discloses the things that are to like everybody. So we can have a conversation with the reporter, and all of that gets disclosed. But the we can also have an internal discussion, which won't necessarily just get disclosed. So you get that nice sort of you. So it's more than just the the, the report. Yeah. Um, 
And it also gives us easy CVE assignment. We, we are a CNA, so Node became a CNA. I helped manage the, the CVEs, requesting them. I was quite clunky to sort of do it on your own. They managed getting them and assigning them and, and all that kind of stuff. So it's nice on that front too. Um, so let's move on to creating fixes. We've triaged them, we've decided it's a problem. We now actually then move over and we have a, a private repository. So we have a public repository, obviously. We have a, a private organization and we use that as a place to, it's basically a clone of Node Core. We can uh, create PRs, we can test them. Um, there are some challenges which I'll cover in the next thing, but that's kind of the way we, we now work on the fixes. The challenges we have is, you know, it goes back to that volunteer problem is that Sometimes it takes very specific expertise, so it's a problem in this very specific thing, and often you know, vulnerabilities are things where it's a real edge case, um, and people who are volunteers, they may not be available for two or three weeks because they're busy doing something at work, right, in their day job, and so that's still a, a challenge. The OSS OSSF funding really helped here in that we could get people who could say, no, nope, I'm gonna work on creating a fix, that's my top priority. Um, the other thing that doesn't completely fixed is that we support a lot of platforms, and sometimes these are often, uh, and the example we have later is like very platform specific, so getting that platform specific expertise. Windows seems to be one we in particular have problems with, um, and interpreting like in the Windows world, is this something that is considered a vulnerability or not is often a bit of a challenge. The other challenge is that it's harder to work in private, like we're all used to in our project actually working very collaboratively in public, um, our, our CI is set up where we can do tests across all the platforms, but we don't do that until um, we're ready to ship fixes because we consider once we actually run the CI we've disclosed um, to a large audience, because all of our collaborators, so over 100 people can see those um, and um, get onto the machines and stuff like that. So we actually have more limited CI testing in our private organization. We still have GitHub Actions, but that doesn't run on most of our platforms. Harder to pull in people, we have to like add them to the organization and stuff like that, so that's not, not so great. And actually when we go to do a security release, we, we actually lock down our, our, our CI so we can do a full CI before we do the release, but that means that regular, the, the rest of the collaborators can't actually do releases, do tests, and you know, our last security release we locked out for a week because we had a, a fun time. And so the rest of the project couldn't actually continue, you know, have planned PRs and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, then when we get to security releases, we actually have a really well-documented security release process, and that's something where, again, I think if you're interested in our experience, I don't have time to go through it all, but you can go and read the, the 26 steps that we have. We've built this up over time. Definitely the experience is, is having this well-written down and documented is uh, a really good thing. It helps us make sure we're consistent, we don't miss the steps. Um, uh, it involves coordinating with a lot of the collaborators. Uh, we give no advance notice to various parties, like we have a team that actually builds doc Docker containers, so they need to know that something's coming on a particular day. Um, uh, we have to put together the information about the vul vulnerabilities, the CI lock and unlock and stuff like that. But there's a lot of work, I guess, is, is, is what I was trying to say there. If we step off, take up where we were from before, we in Node Private, we have our fixes now in theory, we've gone through, we've got those all tested at least with some GitHub Actions, but on a subset of our platform. We then lock the CI and we will do a full Jenkins run, make sure that we can get those green, and then they get published from our private, and, and actually we do the testing in our test CI, but then we actually have a whole separate CI for security reasons, so we have a much, more small, a much smaller set of people who can actually get access to the infra that's used to publish to our, our uh, actual download site, and that's our, our release CI, um, and then things go out to the download site. So what didn't work on this side? Basically, releasers having to do all this work. We added 26 steps. Only one of those steps is actually to do the release itself, which is a big piece of work. Um, so having, expecting the releasers to add in all those other steps wasn't, uh, wasn't working all that well. Again, ad hoc coordination didn't work that well, like trying to hope that the people would be notified and stuff like that, so writing down the process. Um, and this is, I'll talk a little bit about more security release stewards, but similar to our triage, having somebody who was kind of dedicated to help the releasers with those 26 steps and doing it every time, again, didn't work that well because they got burned out and eventually it was like, ah, I, I just don't want to do that. 
again, we ran through a few people doing it that way. So what's working for us, again, you might see a trend, is we actually have uh, a, uh, a rotation, and we have a security release steward sort of role for any security release where they're going to walk through those 26 steps and basically do all the coordination and work that you need to do other than the release itself. Um, and that involves like making sure we have the CVs assigned, what's the text that goes in there, giving the pre-notifications to the different teams, sending out the emails, like we have a NodeSec mailing list that we, uh, we announce security release stuff, so sending out all that stuff. And so what is working is having uh, a rotation of a larger number of release stewards. In this case, we really push to make it a company commitment as opposed to an individual commitment. In a lot of cases, we see individuals can make a commitment because they're interested in open source. But if their company hasn't committed that they can make this their top priority when we need to do a security release, I think that's a stressor on them, right? Like you're saying, we need this now, but they, you know. So we push to say, no, we want our release stewards to be people who their company has said, we, we sponsor you as a release steward. We actually have it on our public site that it's the company that's made this commitment and like here are the people who have done it. Um, Unfortunately, we're missing a few big companies there that actually are active in Node.js and active users, so I'd, I wish this was bigger, but many thanks to the, the companies that have stepped up to, to be the, the, the security release stewards. Um, and I'll just close out with a real example before I hand it hand over to Paula. So this is it's just one of a real example. So it's imagine you're a Windows developer, you have OpenSSL already installed on your, on your Windows box, um, and you install a module, but you have a typo. I think you probably heard the, many people talk about the sort of typo squatting. That installs uh, something called providers.dll. And you can see there's some code here. It just pops up the calculator executable. That's not really that bad on it itself, but you know, just a good example. And what happens when I actually do the install? The calculator pops up. And like, so me, I've installed a package, and now it's run some arbitrary code on my machine. And in, in the example here, you'll see that it's actually in the post install script, but really any time, this could happen any time after the, uh, the, the package has been installed. So what's actually happened? Um, so when require crypto is called, so you've got some code, you want to use crypto, um, that loads OpenSSL. When OpenSSL loads, it actually does a search for providers.dll, um, starting in the current working directory. So it actually goes up and there's a, there's a standard set of Windows two rules that say, how do you find a DLL? And it starts in the current working directory. And so this package is installed it in your current working directory. It finds it, it runs it. Um, and it'll, in this case, we've actually just run NPM version because NPM uses crypto. So like if you actually CD'd into the directory where you did the install and you ran NPM anything, you will end up with the calculator popping up for you. Um, and that's just an example. Like that one was hard for us because, like, okay, is loading a DLL in your current working directory a vulnerability? Well, that's standard Windows uh, behavior. But you know, we did make a we did make a change. So even though our model might say that's not something we should, we we are, we do look at them and say, well, okay, in the in the greater good, we're going to make a change and, and improve things. So at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Paula. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, and this is the yeah. okay. <laughs> So I'll, I'll move to the uh, proactive side, although the reactive side has been really an adventure, as you can see. I'll touch on the history again and security uh, working group, active roster, recent successes, ongoing initiatives, and most importantly, how you can help as an individual or more importantly, as an organization. The working group history, we touched on earlier that this was something that came up uh, from the Node Security Project Vulnerability Database being donated to the Node.js Foundation. It never really stuck. Uh, it needed some ownership, and the OSSF funding really provided critical mass to form the working group, and the working group focuses on Node itself. Uh, there's uh, an illustrious group of people in the working group. If you want to see the full roster, it is all open in GitHub. So we'll talk about some recent successes. The threat model was also uh, mentioned previously. I'll cover uh, next dependency vulnerability check, permissions model, and then security best practices. The 
being proactive means knowing about the vulnerabilities before somebody sends you an email. And that is what uh, automation is really important here because tooling that scans de uh, vulner dependencies for vulnerabilities lets the working group know about these things before someone in the field says, hey, you know, I've got this problem and, and sending an email that highlights it to the rest of the world. The nice thing about this automation is that if there is a vulnerability, it will open an issue so that the team can address it. Permissions model, and again, I'm stepping in here for Raphael. He did a lot of work on this. It's something that I think we're all very proud of. Um, and the use case for this is, oh, I'm sorry. It was released in Node 20 as an experimental feature. It's very cool. Um, so we'll talk about the use case. I'm a humble dev and I've got a problem I need to solve. And of course I start Googling and I find a wonderful package that's the problem solver package. It solves all my problems. And of course I find it in a random tutorial on the internet because that's obviously the most secure place to find solutions to my problems. Um, the problem solver package, I do like a brief look at the code and I, you know, it's like, okay, it looks at empty passwords. Of course it must need something from that, but I'm, <laughs> I am a security conscious developer and I decide to use the permissions model. Um, so I say, you know, my application and my process really shouldn't be doing anything outside of index.js. So if somebody wants to read that file, that's fine, but you know, nothing else. So when I run my code, I find, oh, I have an access exception. A little more closely here, um, because the, um, the permissions model allows you as the developer to assert what resources your process will have access to and what not. You can make sure that the code that you depend on is not doing anything that you don't expect it to do. So it's really a very cool feature. It's an experimental mode at this point to allow developers to become more proactive. So we talked about making Node itself, you know, handling things more proactively in Node through dependency checks and so forth but now are actually moving out into making our developers more proactive in terms of security. So please, if you do try this or use it in your development processes, give us feedback. It's, it's really a cool uh, tool to get developers to be more proactive about security. Right now, the resources that you can restrict are read to the file system, write to the file system, um, spawning child processes and using node worker threads. So it's, it's a very cool feature. During runtime, you can also assert and find out what uh, permissions are available to you. So it's an interesting tool for developers, again, to make developers more proactive and security conscious. That leads to best practices because we're moving into this proactive world where it's not just about hardening Node and having the Node 4 team being proactive about security as they've been for a long time, but part of it is making the developers more, pro more proactive as well. I've got the uh, QR code up there if you want to link into that security best practices world. Um, it did start based on the threat model work that was discussed previously. So threat model, um, looking at Node itself, what does Node trust, what does Node not trust, what's the threat surface of Node. But then as you heard, there are things that developers can do that are not secure and we don't want Node to necessarily be blamed for that, but we also need to enable our developers to use Node in a secure manner. And that's where we have a fork here and the creation of a Node best practices document targeted at developers so that they can do secure coding. Um, the threat model is more for the security researchers and for determining whether something really is a vulnerability in Node or not. But now we also have some proactive advice for developers. For example, Denial of service. I mean, if you're if you're not catching errors in the web server or the web service socket, um, you're opening yourself up to denial of service, and it should be something that a developer doesn't have to scour the internet for. If they're a Node developer, they should have something to refer to that tells them how to be a secure Node developer. Mitigating prototype pollution. Um, this is something, it's a good example of what does Node trust and what does Node not trust because prototype pollution is something that's inherent uh, based on the JavaScript language. 
but we need to educate developers on ways to avoid it. So those are a lot of our uh, recent wins, but the work is ongoing. There's a lot more work to do. Um, more automation on dependency updates. The OSSF scorecard, very cool. Um, automating security releases. We talked about 26 steps. Extending the permissions model that was just launched with 20. And looking at SigStore and Salsa to make sure that you know the dependencies are who they say they are. This work is just starting. And if you'd like to get involved, please do. There's a, a link to all the current initiatives, which has these and more. I'll um, kind of beat you over the head to get involved a little bit later. <laughs> but automating dependency updates, step one is the vulnerability and the dependency side, making sure that all your dependencies are, are not introducing new vulnerabilities. And then, of course, you move on to hardening the build. So the first step is well underway and still being um, enhanced and uh, growing. But you see on the on your left, <laughs> on your left, the dependencies that are already being uh, automated, and then um, a nice diagram from Sneak for Sync. I'm, I have heard it pronounced both ways. I, I tend to do Sneak of the source integrity problem and the build integrity problem. So that work is ongoing and much needed. OSSF scorecard. Uh, Node is currently, this is implemented for the Node project, but also you can get a detailed report with the scores by the repository, which is a very cool way to say, you know, is there something here that I depend on that's a weaker link in the chain? Overall, right now, it's 7.3 out of 10. But most importantly, there's a link there uh, from Step Security about, you know, how can this score be improved? And a shout out to Step Security for this. I've got a, a link. Um, to the actual store scorecard there if you're interested. Um, so the step security piece is really uh, cool because it was a good way to get more people involved in this topic. Um, it was a good first issue to pin dependencies and somebody here was very cr proud that they had their first contribution to Node because they, they pinned dependencies. And uh, I think this area is great to raise awareness of people um, who want to contribute to Node, but to contribute to security. Again, the more people who know about this and the more people who care about it, the higher quality and the better security we get. Automating the security release process, 26 steps. Um, this involves a security releaser for each release line plus a release steward, and altogether about 700 hours of work. And we heard that, you know, a week of elapsed time. So uh, malicious actors won't wait. And so automation, we've heard throughout the conference that automation is really the way forward to get a, a mean time to response down that uh, keeps the um, ecosystem secure. And ideally, uh, because normal release would have one path and a security release has a slightly different path, the team would need like two buttons that doesn't preclude perhaps some of those normal release activities from happening while we're working on a security release. And it should be just an easy button, I wish. One for each. My favorite part, and it got wrapped there, is how you can help as individuals and organizations. Because sure, the um, individuals are the people who do the pull requests, who do the triage, who do the security releases, but those individuals, nine times out of 10, work for organizations, they have day jobs, and the organizations are the people are benefiting from these open source projects. I mean, they, you know, most likely all of them have websites, so they're using JavaScript, they're benefiting from the open source ecosystem. They employ the people the people do these uh, important tasks to keep the ecosystem secure. So there has to be a balance of both. But as an individual, in order of um, perhaps increasing impact you can have on the ecosystem, take on a good first issue, um, have a look around, they're, they're tagged, volunteer as a security subject matter expert, help the community. Um, this is one I really like, is just come to a security working group meeting. I've got the QR code there. The meetings are all published, and um, it's open for anyone to just come and sit in. You can learn something. You might find something there that you would want to contribute to. 
champion one of those initiatives that are ongoing um, with the group. Volunteer as a triage person or a lease steward or an actual releaser. And then, of course, you know, at, the, at this highest level for the node ecosystem, become a core contributor. And if you're saying, yeah, that sounds pretty well, daunting, I don't know how to do that, I'll plug the Grace Hopper celebration um, because we are the largest gathering of women and non-binary technologists. On September 22nd, we have a pure virtual event that's open source day, and Node will be a featured project there, and I know some of my colleagues are gonna do a workshop on your first Node contribution, so I'll plug that as well. Organizations, top five. Contribute. I mean, for the, you know, don't don't buy one of your executives a new chair and take take that money and contribute it to the bug bounty. You know, it's like these are little things, price of a cup of coffee kinds of things. Join a foundation that supports open source packages that you depend on, like Node. So, I'll bet every organization depends on JavaScript if they have a website, which they do. Join the OpenJS Foundation. Implement security vulnerability processes that consider the open source ecosystem. You heard about, you know, it's hard to really do these things with a pure volunteer workforce. Please don't send emails or open um, issues that everybody can see if you find a vulnerability. So start to work that into your organizational DNA. Reward people. This is one of the most important things because the individuals are the people who do the work, but the organizations that benefit from open source need to reward that work. Um, just being a security point of contact for one of your key open source dependencies. Reward people. <laughs> reward people for helping with triage, fixing vulnerabilities, and doing the security releases and stewardship. And uh, we're between you and happy hour, so thank Thank you so much for um, participating, and anybody have questions? <laughs> anybody? Uh, yeah. I'm always busy because, you know, it's a handful of people that aren't <laughs> drinking yet. Um, but, like, you, you called out the sort of pattern where you move so almost like a like a tier one support kind of like operations model where you had rotations and defined schedules and you were avoiding burnout. So there were like a lot of interesting patterns there that aren't necessarily security specific, but uh, sort of alleviate that. Like was that like just a natural evolution or did you find that that was like a really, somebody pointed you at that and said like, hey, this, this work that you're doing is very similar to uh, the kind of operational work that I'll say, unfortunately, it was a journey of discovery. Mm -hmm. So, like, I, I, I work at Red Hat and I worked at IBM before, and we've always had a, a, a pretty good team contributing to Node. And so I, I prioritized having team members involved in the triage or, or <coughs> team members involved as security stewards. I, I've done it a number of times. But me encouraging other team members, just having that one person, like, I think it ended up that that one person, because they stood up and did it once, they did it the second time, and the third time, and the fourth time, and then mm -hmm. being the only one who was doing it, just, it was not a fun thing to do f on your own. And so, that didn't work. They eventually said, I don't wanna do this. And that actually happened to me with several team members, right? So it's like, well, okay, this just isn't working. And the triage was a similar case where we had a number of people, not necessarily my team, but in, in from other companies who'd stepped up and I think the problem is, is because there was no defined scope, they would get involved and then they would kind of feel the responsibility and, and other people maybe didn't jump in because they saw somebody doing it, but then nobody else did. So this person then felt like they needed to do it and they needed to do it some more and then eventually it became more than they could handle and they would bow out completely. And, th mm -hmm. and that actually, we went through that cycle several times as well. So I think we, we learned the hard way that the, um, just sort of having like somebody will jump in and handle it doesn't work so well because you end up, maybe it gets done because somebody jumps in but then they take on more than they really should. And the rotation has helped a lot in both of those places where like you feel more comfortable. Like I think there are people who volunteered for the rotation knowing that the scope was 
two think, weeks on triage yeah. or the next security release versus, oh, well, if I volunteer for one, I'm going to be stuck <laughs> with them all, right? Like, yeah. So I think it, it's kind of counterintuitive, right? Like you're making a higher, a higher commitment, but at the same time, it's almost an easier commitment because <laughs> it's bounded. And, and the, the one on the stewardship, we really pushed to, to say, I, you know, we want your company saying, yes, you can do this, not just you personally volunteering. The triage people are, are still just like a personal volunteer, but like the, the security steward, it was like, we want to make this a company thing. We want to give credit to the company for committing that to make sure we're, you know, when we say, hey, it's now, they've got the, they don't have to like feel bad because their company's saying, no, you shouldn't. It should be their company is like, yeah, we committed to do this. It's your turn to go do it. Yeah, thanks. Like, I feel like that's a really interesting pattern that could work in lots of different open source or volunteer spaces where, you know, burnout for people who are sort of, uh, overstretched, right? Like you're sort of inequitably sharing the burden of whatever that work happens to be, so. Yeah, and I think the, the interesting thing for me is that it's, like I think there was resistance to that kind of stuff. If we hadn't gone through those cycles, I don't think people would have, they wouldn't have been in favor, because it's, it's much more structured than like open source. It's not so voluntary. It's like, yeah, we're gonna have a schedule, you're gonna do your thing, but counter, sort of counter to what you might think, it actually reduces the stress and, and then as opposed to the opposite. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? Test, test. Yeah. Woot. Um, curious if you've tried out um, GitHub's private vulnerability reporting feature, and if you have, what features it lacks. I mean, I, I, could, I could see some clear features that it lacked right. from the flow you needed, but are there any things that like really stand out for you as features that are completely missing for you to use it over the hacker one flow that you, the hacker one and then private, vulner, private repository flow that like you're currently using? So I, I can't give you a really good answer because I haven't personally used it. I do know that Indici, which is one of the projects that's under our organization, they use, I think, the CVE assignment side of the, that flow. They, they still don't use the reporting because we get all of our reports in through HackerOne. Um, so that's the only feedback I can give you is that they have used the CVE assignment, which they found to be easier, I think, and uh, because they're, it's like they're not assigning them for Node, they're assigning them for Indici, which then we, we basically assume. But you could ask uh, Matteo, or even ask like if you you know if you put opened an issue that asked about that in the uh, the Indici repo, that would be a place you might get some feedback. So. The context on this question is um, one of the things that we're we're working on in the Open Source Security Foundation is and and Alpha Omega is bulk generating security fixes at scale, um, and the idea is currently driven around the idea of using PVR as the driving force because we can both open a private issue but also give you the fix in a simultaneous automated way. Right. Um, but, you know, if it <clears throat> if there are other organizations sim similar to Node.js that are like, no, we're not going to use PVR because we have our flow. And it PVR kinda, is, oh, the private Private reporting, vulnerability yeah. reporting, which lets, you know, reporters open G -G, uh, GitHub security advisories. And you know, tri you know, so, so you, you're triaging it all as if it's coming in, but it's like a hacker one report, but coming in via GitHub. Right. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't think we'd say we've got our flow. You you can kind of see that's the part of like the value. You can see what we do and don't do and how it fits in. Um, so I, I don't think anybody would say no. We wouldn't consider that. We probably don't understand it well enough. Um, there are some subsets of the people who are sort of experimenting with parts of it. So over time, we may get experience. Um, and you know whatever whatever works, I think for us, and we definitely have a chat. You know the challenges in using a private repo. Our GitHub minutes always run out because I guess there's less minutes for private than there is for public, um, and so just doing testing and it's uh, the that sort of part is where our pain point ends up being right oh, today. They always run out for you on the on the on the action minutes. It's pretty much. I would say the last couple security releases that have, and we've, we've talked, and they're like, you already have as many as we give anybody, and I, we've had that conversation. I guess we're, we're looking at can we cut them back, because like, we don't have nearly as much testing. Our, our regular, our full test suite is like a Jenkins instance, 
across like, you know, AIX, SmartOS, all sorts of different architectures and platforms. And so we don't, we don't use um, GitHub Actions for like our, our platform coverage, but we do you have GitHub Actions for like our sniff testing. And we, we will run on Mac, we'll run on Linux, we'll run on uh, Windows. And I think, we, you know, I think we discovered like our Mac one, the pricing is like 10 times per minute, or I, I'm picking a number out of my head, but it was enough higher that like our Mac OS runs were burning through like all our minutes somehow. And so that is that is one that we, and then we're stuck. And like, yeah, we've had several times with like Miles who's been, he, he's, we've been like, hey, can you do anything with us? We've got a security release we just ran out. And I think that's happened several times. But have, uh, you thought about, have you thought about standing up like a whole separate Jenkins instance just for just for security stuff? We have a whole sec separate Jenkins instance for release already. So we have one of everything we're going to ship, which is a subset of what we have on um, the main test suite. Um, so you know, we, we ship on CentOS, not on CentOS, we ship on RHEL now, um, but we actually test on RHEL and Ubuntu, you know, a whole bunch of different distros, right? So we, uh, we, we, haven't, we haven't considered that just due to the extra work that it would take to spin up something that would give us significantly more coverage. Most of the time, like the GitHub Actions gives us a good enough sniff test that, you know, things don't go wrong. The last one where we were locked down for a week is clearly <laughs> an example where, Yikes. you know, it's, it's usually that different, having a large, broad platform set actually gives us better test coverage because usually your problems are on some edge case, maybe it's timing, maybe it's like networking stack. So it's not really a, that that platform has a problem, but they often expose the problems and you don't find them until you've got that like, hey, we just covered 10 different platforms, the timing is, like our, our, our Linux One machines are like so fast, they expose all the things that when you're too fast. And then we've got other ones which are so slow, like the, the Raspberry Pis that we used to have, they would expose the ones that are too slow, right? And so, it, but to get that same coverage that it would be just too much work. We can barely keep our current one going. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, I'll say thanks again for coming to the last talk of the day and sticking around all the way to the end. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>